I'm talking loosely using this word navigation for actually a grab bag of lots of different things. What does it mean? What does it entail? Well, the two fundamental problems of navigation are to figure out where am I? And second, to figure out how do I get from here to there, wherever I want to go, wherever the food or mates or shelter or whatever else is that I want. Okay? Okay, so those are the two problems you need to solve to navigate successfully that any animal needs to solve. So let's think about what that entails. If you see this, for example, you immediately know where you are, right? You guys recognize that place. But you also can quickly tell where would you go if it started raining? Well, one option is you might try to run across the street and get in there, or you might also know that right behind you is a student center and you could turn around and maybe that would be faster, especially if the, um, the traffic is not, if the tra if traffic is crossing the street. You know where to go if you're hungry. You might want to turn around and go backwards into the student center, right? Um, if you detect that someone's following you or you feel in danger, you'd also have ideas where to go. If this is your environment and you know about it, these are all kinds of information you have immediate access to as soon as you know where you are. Okay. Similarly, if you see this, right, you immediately know where you are, um, and you would know where can you go if you're cold or thirsty or tired. There'd be different answers to all of those, right? But you know your environment, you know where things are, and you can plan those routes. Okay? So these kinds of judgments rely on specific knowledge of those specific places. You recognize that specific place, and you have, as we'll discuss more in a moment, a mental map in your head. You have to, where all the things are that you care about that are going to enable you to plan a route to get from A to B. Okay? But even if you've never been to a place before, there's still a lot of kinds of navigation you can do. They're different, but they're also important. So even if you've never been there, if you see a picture like this, there's a lot you can glean from this, right? So first of all, you know um, that you're, you know what kind of place this is. You know you're up in the mountains. You're not in a desert. You're not in a city. You're not inside some building someplace, okay? Second of all, you can immediately see places you can go here. Right? Even if there wasn't a hiker there showing you probably where the trail is, you could look at this and you could plan routes and you could think, hmm, that might be a good place to pitch my tent next to the pond. Looks flat. I could get there from here. Or you might think, huh, if I need to get over that pass, what the hell am I going to do? If it was me, I might think, hmm, well, hmm, I don't know, I don't know. If it's my friend Mo back there who's a serious mountaineer, she would go, oh, yeah, right, oh, no, oh, this will be fun, let's do that. Sometimes I hike with her, and it's terrifying, but exciting. OK, if you're here, you have a whole different kind of information. You can see immediately, OK, we're indoor. We don't know this place, but we're indoor. We know roughly what kind of place this is, probably some kind of institution or dorm or some kind of uh, official building. And you can see where you can go. Most obviously, you can go straight down here. But you can also guess. There are probably places you can go to the left and right. And, and you can have all kinds of um, guesses about where you might be able to navigate in this place even though you've never been there before. Okay. How about here? Well, here you can immediately see, well, we're sheltered, we're in a cave, there's some protection. If we wanted water, well, maybe there's a river down there that eroded this, we might be able to get water and so forth. You can make navigational guesses of, of biological relevance. Or here, if you're out in a snowstorm and you're cold, even if you don't know where this is, you can make some guesses about where you might go in. Okay? So the point is that there are lots of different versions and facets of these two questions. Where am I? And how do I get from here to wherever else it is I want to go? Okay? So let's flesh out some of these. So the first kind of where am I is recognizing a specific familiar location. Like this is my living room, a particular place I know. But another kind of where am I is this unfamiliar, what kind of place is this? So this might be a living room, or a city street, or a mountain, or a desert, right? Some desert, I don't know which one, but we have the kind of place, all right? Which is also if you got plunked down there at random, uh, that, that would also be useful information to have, okay? 
and um, one of your readings that was assigned for today, tonight, uh, is the Walter et al. paper that deals with brain regions that are involved in making this kind of distinction. Okay? All right. Another kind of information that you can glean, which probably isn't as immediately obvious from just intuitive thinking about what's entailed in navigation as we've been doing so far, but that is, turns out to be profoundly important in the whole literature of navigation and its brain basis and how it works, is the spatial layout of the current uh, situation. So close your eyes, and we'll just do a very simple little introspection. Uh, don't open them, but think, how far away is the wall behind you? Okay, so you probably don't know exactly, but you have some kind of sense of where it is. Okay, how far away is the wall to your left? Okay, again, you probably have some kind of intuitive sense. Okay, okay, you can open them. That was just a dopey little introspection. Um, it turns out that there are neurons in your brain that are encoding that information probably all the time. We published a paper a couple years ago that I may not get time to, to, to talk about next time, so I'll just briefly mention the capsule statement. We published a paper using that pattern analysis method you guys have just learned to show that even when the task doesn't require at all, it at all, when people are looking at a familiar location, they are representing all the time what it looks like behind them. Okay, so some people call this situation awareness. You are just aware at some low grade, no matter what you're doing, no matter how riveting my lecture is, there is some part of your mind that is representing how far behind you that wall is and what, what it looks like back there. Okay? And it turns out that a very central part of this, um, this representation is the spatial layout, the geometry of this room, like the, the um, what do you call it, the ratio of the length to, of the, um, the aspect ratio of the room, how long this wall is as a ratio to how, how long this wall is. Okay. Okay, so we'll get more evidence for that. Um, and actually one of the readings, the paper by Dilks, talks a little bit, not quite so literally, but sort of about a brain region that is involved in extracting that information. Um, right, and so, you know, here, you, wherever you are in this room, you have a sense of where you are and you have a sense of the shape of that room. Even before I asked you about it, you were representing it, as we'll show. Okay, so how do, we, how do we do this business of getting from A to B? Well, there's lots of different ways to navigate. Um, and the simplest possible way is something called beaconing. And that is just, you actually see the target where you want to go and you go towards it, okay? So if you want to get to the green building and you see this, even though you're down here and the Chem E building is in the way and all of that, you recognize green building, that's my heading. Then you have other problems to solve, like you can't actually go through that or you gotta think about how to get around and all of that, but you have your heading immediately, okay? So similarly, ships that are navigating in the fog may hear a foghorn or see a light uh, and know that that's the entrance to a harbor and then they just go straight to that thing. Okay, so that's one kind of navigational cue that humans or animals or robots could use to navigate around in the world. Um, and the important thing about beaconing is it doesn't require this cognitive map. You don't need to know anything else about where you are in the, you know, about your broader surrounding and where you are. All you need to know is, that's my target, I'm heading to that thing, end of story, okay? And so I mentioned that just to contrast it with all the other kinds of cases of navigation we'll talk about. Um, so, uh, uh, that require, when you can't see the target you're going towards, and those require this kind of mental map. Okay, so let's say a little bit more about where this idea comes from. The, um, the history of the idea of a cognitive map, um, it, it played a very important role in the history of psychology. Um, and what happened was in the 1940s, it was the heyday of behaviorism and there were all these kind of weird ideas that we shouldn't talk about mental representations. It's very nice to be out of that phase, but anyway, it reigned supreme for quite a few decades. And in the middle of that phase, when psychology had turned into this really, um, really kind of boring enterprise of characterizing stimuli and responses and pretending that there weren't mental representations in between or that if there were, we shouldn't talk about them. Um, <clears throat> in the middle of that period, um, a guy named Tolman was training rats, doing the usual kind of behavioristic thing, training them to run mazes. And he trained a rat uh, to run this maze. So you put a rat here and it learns pretty quickly 
even if there are other possible routes, it learns that if I go down here, turn left, right, right, I end up at my goal where there's a cookie. Okay? And so the behaviorist wanted to say that what the rat has learned is straight, left, right, right. Series of actions. Okay? But if what the rat had learned was in fact straight, left, right, right, then he wouldn't have done what happened next. So Tolman took the rat train to do this and now put him in a maze like this. He blocked off the route that the rat had learned before. So what the rat does is it goes down here and it goes, oh crap, can't do that anymore. Comes back out here and goes straight this way. Does everybody get how, that, how revealing that is? All of a sudden, we can see that this rat doesn't just have straight left, right, right. That's not what he did. The rat has some kind of mental representation of the spatial layout of his environment. And he has some kind of vector um, uh, direction of that goal. He knows where that goal is. Okay? So that was a key um, chink in the armor of behaviorism in the early days of psychology that led people to say, oh, yeah, there probably is some kind of mental representation, even in a rat. Okay? And next lecture, we'll talk about the neurons in the rat's brain that enable him to do that. And we'll only get glimmers in that direction in today's lecture. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's what I, that's the kind of idea that I'm talking about when I say a map in the head. And we'll elaborate more on it as we go. Okay, so you, 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 you guys too have a map in your head of, the, of familiar environments. So for example, your ma the map in your head may not look exactly like this, but you've got some kind of information like this. Uh, and if you take a moment to figure out where you are, you can all do that. Even if the numbers weren't on there conveniently to help you, boom, that's where you are right now, right? Uh, and further, um, you can figure out if you got hungry and wanted to walk out rudely. If you get hungry, that's fine, go for it. Um, if you needed to suddenly get out of here and get some food, you might think, huh, I'm here, where's nearby food in my environment? Oh, I could go over to Stata, right, get some food. Um, your next question would be, how do I get there from here? And for that, a key piece of information you need, actually, let's, let's stop and think about this. What else do you need to know? Like, let's suppose now you decided to go over to the Stata cafeteria to get some food. You already have some kind of representation like this in your head. You know where you are in it, and you know where your destination is in it. What else do you need to know to plan a route? Take a moment and plan a route and then think and watch yourself and think about all the kinds of information you need to take into account to plan that route. Okay, everybody got a route planned? What did you take into account besides just where you are and where the goal is? Yeah, uh, Peter? Yeah. Uh, the obstacles in the way. Obstacles in the way, absolutely. We'll talk more about this. These are called navigational affordances and barriers, absolutely. Like, I'm looking at Stata right now, but I can't go that way, right? Absolutely. And this will also interact a little bit with some of the stuff Sarah will talk about in a week or two when she talks about intuitive ideas of physics. So the, my knowledge that I can't go to Stata this way, even though I can see it through the window, requires me to understand glass and the fact that I can't go through glass. And so your understanding of the physics of the world interacts with your understanding of navigation. We'll talk about them as separately, but I'm just noting, and maybe Sarah will think of some way to connect this when she talks about physics. If, whatever. <laughs> um, absolutely, very good. Navigational barriers. What else do you need to figure out to plan a route from there? You're sitting right there right now. Before you get up and start walking over there, what do you need to figure out? Yeah, is it Andrea? I'm sorry, Andrea? No. Nina. Nina. Oh, geez, I'm sorry. Oh, this is Andrea right here. Is that right? Claudia. Oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, all right. Nina, Claudia, Nina, Claudia. Okay, yes, Nina. Um, starting orientation, like what orientation like Yes. Which way are you facing? Absolutely. Fundamental to navigation. Um, in a map, you need to not know not just where am I, but which way am I facing. Absolutely. And so you know, um, oh, I thought I had a little arrow popping up. I don't. Anyway, you know if we blew this up a bit, that you're facing this way. And so you need to turn your direction to head up that way. Absolutely. Okay, so these are all things that you need to know to be able to navigate in the world. 
Okay. Um, oh yeah, there's my arrow. Right, we're facing this way and you want to go that way and so you need to both take the barriers into account and get your heading. Correct. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, and this is funny, you know, what routes are possible from here? This is a sort of question of, you know, what are the barriers? What are the navigational affordances? Okay. Another really fundamental thing that you need to do as a navigating organism, us and everyone else, the, the bats and the monarchs and everyone else, all of us navigating organisms, is you need a system to be able to find yourself again when you're lost. Because no matter how fabulous your navigation system is, it's going to break down now and then. And every once in a while, you're going to get lost. And you need a way to get your bearings again once you're lost. And it turns out there's a whole rich, fascinating literature on this problem of reorienting yourself, getting your bearings again when you're lost. And that'll happen in the next lecture. OK, so this is sort of a survey of all the stuff you need to know to navigate. All right? And so notice what we've done now. This is sort of low-tech MAR computational theory of navigation. We haven't really looked at any data other than the rat that I couldn't resist putting in there. We've just thought about the problem. What is the nature of the problem? And as I keep saying in this class, key insights about how the mind works and what the different pieces do have to start from first thinking about what is the problem being solved? What are the pieces of that problem? Okay? All right. So now, having laid out the landscape of the problem, I should say a spoiler alert, when I, I spent a lot of the weekend laying this out, and then when I went to actually find all the bits of literature that were going to answer this beautifully, they're patchy little bits, but this is an ongoing exciti exciting area of research, and I'm not going to be able to serve up a beautiful little thing with a different brain region for each of these. We'll get kind of, sort of, in some glimmers, but it's, it's not, one, it's probably not one-to-one -one in reality, and two, it's, we're uh, in the middle of that literature right now, okay, including the papers that you were assigned to read. Okay. Um, but so the agenda is, what is the neural basis of all these abilities? 